The internet has rapidly propelled the digital revolution into an age of cultural, social, and political awareness. From personal interest to global community, technology has enabled a modern day online renaissance. Here at Sun Microsystems, we had an incredible opportunity to speak with a few of the pioneers who are blazing a virtual trail through this new frontier. To achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. That view is tremendous. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What made the internet interesting, what made the internet sexy, um, and this is the original internet, you know, 89 to 94, the real internet, was that people were connecting to one another, was that here we had a new communications tool. Here we had something that allowed me to talk to other people and that that allowed for the formation of new cultures. Participation is non-hierarchical in a sense that everyone's idea is important and everyone's idea can count. And I don't think that there's a limit to how many people can participate when you're talking about something like the internet. We're basically at a point where new technologies are enabling fast, affordable, and increasingly ubiquitous access to technologies that enable people to create and distribute their own media. So this is radically transforming the entire media landscape. You see the rise of the blogosphere. And what all of this sort of means is that the traditional barriers of the journalist and the recipient um, of the media maker and the media consumer have been reconfigured. All of this technological equipment that it requires to create media is so cheap that it's accessible and I can go down the street to Best Buy and get what I need. And then simultaneously we have um, the internet that's working well enough where broadband is pervasive enough and the audience is out there that I can utilize that as the, a, even a potentially a better means for promotion and distribution of the media. I think that increasingly, you know, the, 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 the cost of the tools to create really, you know, broadcast quality content keeps coming down and down to where it, it, it is almost going to be not prohibitive at all for anybody to gain access to the tools. For a very long time, taste and artistic training have been things that only a small number of people have been able to develop. Only a few people could afford to participate in the production of many types of media. Raw materials like pigments were expensive. Same with tools like printing presses. Even as late as 1963, it cost Charles Pignot over $600,000 to create and cut a single font family. Over the last 20 years, however, the cost of tools related to the authorship of media has plummeted. For very little money, anyone can create and distribute things like newsletters or videos. Suddenly consumers are learning the language of these authorship tools. The fact that tons of people know names of fonts like Helvetica is weird. And when people start learning something new, they perceive the world around them differently. For example, throughout most of the history of movies, the audience didn't really understand what a craft editing was. Now as more and more people have access to things like iMovie, they begin to understand the manipulative power of editing. As people start learning and experimenting with these languages of authorship, they don't necessarily follow the rules of good taste. Ugly when compared to pre-existing notions of taste is a bummer, but ugly as a representation of mass experimentation and learning is pretty damn cool. Over time, as consumer-created media engulfs the other kind, it's possible that completely new norms develop around the notions of talent and artistic ability. What I think is important is to look at computers, software, hardware, software, you name it, as just extensions of the wetware. I mean, it's the mind interface with information. I think in all respect it's really like early adopter music fans, people that want to find out more, people that are always on the lookout for new things. There's, there's, definitely, there's definitely people like this as well and they are then the ones that spread uh, things to, 
to other people. Uh, it's sort of like your early adapter bracket. They are definitely responsible for embracing change and then transmitting it to other people. It cannot be underestimated that if somebody else tells you it's good, you're more likely to, to view it as something that which is more interesting. When you just hear something's new or something just came out, then maybe you just dismiss it offhand. I think the personal contact from, or personal recommendations from other people, uh, I think, are definitely very essential. Trust is incredibly important and a complex dynamic in a newly uh, sort of proliferating internet environment. So what you have is multiple opportunities to create and distribute content. I mean, new websites built every day, millions of blogs online all over the world. And the question becomes, how in that glut of information do people find their way to content that matters something to them? The 21st century mythology is about people becoming more and more immersed in their own media spectacle. So part of that is looking at how we're looking at overload, you know, I call it the Times Square mentality. And the other part of that is how you navigate, because making sense of overload is, is not just like you're grabbing bits and pieces, but you're navigating through it as if you're in an ocean of information. People are taking their consumption more seriously. Their consumption is as much an act of work as their production, if not more so. People are already starting to pick and choose. Um, and I think it, the same thing with video blogs and with blogs. People are, are subscribing and downloading the ones that they want to check out every day. The users are the king in our system. They drive everything. Um, I think that's also what sets us apart from other music recommendation systems, that we are totally and 100% socially driven. The technology is a helper, is an enabler in this sense to, to connect knowledge in between people. But uh, yeah, the users are in charge. The nickname that a lot of people are using for it is instead of outsourcing it, you're calling it crowdsourcing, where people share a certain amount of information and everybody runs with it and makes a new thing. One thing that speaks volumes to me is, is citizen journalism or the idea that um, somebody can take a telephone that has video capability and Wi-Fi capability and they can be anywhere in the world and they can put together content and then send it, you know, perhaps thousands of miles away. Technology has enabled Witness to provide video cameras to human rights groups around the world, to train them, to produce and distribute videos that make a real difference in the world. Technology has enabled people all over the world to learn about the human rights issues our partners are working on and to get actively engaged in those campaigns. Anyone can be a journalist. You don't have to work for Current or for CNN to be a journalist. What you have to do is go out and tell a story that you think needs to be told and there'll be lots of ways to distribute that story for people to see. That's a revolutionary change. Television and execs in television should be aware that they can access now this incredibly intelligent and savvy and uh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, wide-awake audience that are on the internet who really aren't just users and consumers. They're also really creating stuff themselves. They're not just couch potatoes where they sit on the TV and consume. They're interactive people that are out to look for information and be critical and participate. They're tremendous researchers, content vetters for us. Uh, they're the ones who keep the content creators honest. That's part of the whole system that exists at Current. I think at the beginning it was definitely the small and independent artists and labels that, that really jumped on the bandwagon fast. They saw the, the huge potential because they are also in the game of being first established. They, they need to get their name out, they need to get known before they can even think about making serious money with their music. Whereas the, the, the larger artists, they already have some revenue chain and they're, they're maybe a bit afraid of disturbing this. But uh, I think we always try to make sure that we are the friends of the music industry, so they always saw that there's no file sharing going on, there's only taste sharing at last if people share taste and not files. And that there's great opportunities to discover and purchase new music. The record labels, they don't get it. The, the fact that I think their business model based on the 20th century situation where you have hard goods like a record that you can drop a needle on and you have that copy 
when it becomes dematerialized and abstract like software, it's the culture of the copy, you know. Um, doesn't matter what the physical hardware is anymore, the software is the culture. You cannot forget that the RIAA uh, sued the first uh, normal radio station uh, when it came into existence in the 20s, the first normal FM radio stations, because they thought that nobody would buy any more music uh, if uh, music gets played on the radio for free. Obviously this turned out to be totally false and uh, radio turned out to be the, the the best thing for music promotion as such. We can see slow and steady incremental progress on all the campaigns, so I know and we know that working together, small groups of committed people can really make a difference. The challenge is just how do you ensure the difference is lasting and very, very systemic. By people participating, they're able to utilize that their brain trust together and the human nature or science or whatever you want to call it will probably tend towards settling out something that's reasonable. We're clearly moving toward an age, and this is how we're building our company is pursuant to this vision, where it's about compelling content on whatever platform people want to see that content. The fun of this space is finding the others, finding other people. And, and, and touching and communicating with other people in new ways, learning that they're not crazy, and then hopefully being inspired to invigorate a civic reality, a social reality again. There is knowledge to be harnessed from the masses. That there's the knowledge of the crowd, which is the most valuable knowledge that there is out there. It's healthy to have multiple perspectives, and it's not like saying that you accept this world that as it is, uh, but saying that music and art and literature are about pulling you by the scruff of your neck <laughs> and saying, look at this other world, you know, I want to show you something different. It's teamwork, it's participation, it's the sharing of ideas and it's the ability to get the best out of ourselves thanks to each other. Wherever this journey takes us, the participation age is here delivering the power of media to the masses, empowering millions across the globe to fight for civil liberties, enabling individuals to seek out new interests and nurture old ones, to cross social and geophysical boundaries. This is an age where the line between entertainer and fan, studio and moviegoer, and journalist and audience is blurring, and the balance of power is shifting.